Chris Perkins, creative lead of Dungeons & Dragons, said this at a talk about how he got into the gaming industry at PAX South 2017. Shit damn balls. I am a gaming professional. Well, he did say that, but he also said this. So the venues that I used to break into the industry, they're not around anymore, and that's because the internet has changed everything. Hi, I'm James Hake, and Chris Perkins was my first game design mentor. He took me under his wing while we were writing Waterdeep Dragon Heist, an adventure for Dungeons and Dragons together. The talk that clip is from is what galvanized me to take all the luck that I'd had in the hobbyist game design space so far and try and run with it and become a full-time professional game designer. Like Chris said though, the paths he blazed aren't around anymore. So here's how I made my own path. And here's how you can do it too. The first step is to enter the jungle. See, the tabletop RPG industry isn't a place with a nice, straightforward career path like video games or chartered accounting. It's a vast, tangled jungle where all the paths to success are overgrown daily by the changing whims of a fickle audience, the ever-tightening grip of corporate greed, and the endless march of new technology. It's a place where money is scarce, and beastly grifters are always lurking in the shadow to take advantage of unwary travelers. I knew this from the start, so I did what any smart person would do. I tried to find a path, and found nothing. Just the patchy remains of a trail that had been blazed long ago, in the magazine era of the 80s and 90s. It was the remnants of a small trail that my high school nerd idol turned professional collaborator Chris Perkins took all the way to the top. My gateway into the gaming industry, a series of magazines that contain short adventure modules that I deconstructed and imitated so that I could eventually become published in them and basically shoehorn my way into the company that I loved. And it worked. Dragons also figured prominently in my professional development. I'm not talking about flying dragons, I'm talking about these dragons. This is another gateway to adventure for many of the people uh, who grew up in the gaming industry that I grew up in. You can see why Chris's path is gone, right? Magazines are dead. RPG magazines especially, with a few exceptions like MCDM's Arcadia. Arcadia. now that I think about it, is, is dead also. And Wizards of the Coast's own D&D Adventurer. A brand new exclusive collection with everything you need to get playing. Join the quest, Dungeons & Dragons Adventurer. Issue one Which is not just published by a third party, but is also only published in the UK and maybe other parts of Europe where there actually is still a strong magazine culture. Unlike here in America. Yet, Despite that foot-in-the-door method Chris used being gone, people are still getting into this industry. People are still making games. How can this be? How can this be that Wizards of the Coast's D&D team is the largest it's been in nearly two decades? Well, if there is a secret to navigating the jungle, let's find it out together. Let's go back to the very beginning, when people were starting to make a career in RPGs before any RPG companies existed at all. In the old days, the path to becoming a career RPG designer began with earning prestige in the world of zines. If you were a fan of D&D in the 1970s and you had an idea that you were desperate to share with the rest of the fandom, an idea that you thought would change the way games were played forever, you needed a zine, or at least to get published in a zine. Now a zine's a homemade, Xerox copied, staple bound pamphlet filled with all the cool game design ideas you had that month, and maybe a few crappy illustrations too, or things that you pulled and photocopied out of a library book. 
In a 2018 interview with Kickstarter, gaming historian John Peterson described zines as the creative commons of the two communities behind early RPGs, wargaming fandom and science fiction fantasy literature fandom. Zines were their internet back then. It's where you would put out ideas, where you advertised your work for sale, where you tried to find like-minded people, where you learned about conventions or clubs, where you went for inspiration. D&D co-creator Gary Gygax's zine, The Doomsday Book, was shared with his wargaming community in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, Gen Con. Old school zines like this cast a wide net and gathered the hottest ideas in wargaming and role-playing, and these regular contributors to some of the zines formed the backbone of the then nascent RPG industry. The alumni of Alarms and Excursions, the most prestigious RPG zine around, included game design luminaries like Robin Laws and Nicole Lindrus, as well as a number of people who were foundational to the design of Dungeons and Dragons, including Gygax himself, Stephen R. Marsh, Jonathan Tweet, and Rob Heinsu, uh, important to the design of 1st, 3rd, and 4th edition D&D, respectively. Other notable designers from D&D's history came from the most professional zines of them all, TSR's in-house magazines Dragon and Dungeon. The editors of these magazines include a lot of names who are still pretty significant in RPGs today. Of course, there's Wolfgang Bauer, who went on to found indie darling Kobold Press. There's Miranda Horner, whose uh, luminary career stretches from the West End D6-based Star Wars role-playing game all the way to the MMO The Elder Scrolls Online. And then, of course, there's Chris Perkins, who began his RPG career at age 14, lying about his age in order to submit to Dungeon Magazine as a kid. And if that list of luminaries sounds like a bit of a sausage fest, well, that's a problem we're still trying to figure out today. So, prestige aside, how did you actually make a zine? And why is this important? Well, people back then needed a typewriter to make the thing, a Xerox printer to run off as many copies as they can, and uh, ideally an institution like a college or a workplace that would let you uh, sneakily copy them off for free. And then you needed some way to distribute them. Typically, conventions were the way to go. Gen Con, Origins, things like that. Uh, a list of conventions today includes also Game Hole Con, Winter Fantasy, PAX Unplugged, and many others. And after you'd managed to get the zine passed out at your local conventions, it still had to be good enough to get people to read it, remember it, and sign up for your mailing list at the end, so that even when the convention was over, you could still have all those people trying to get new copies of your zine, wanting to listen to the cool ideas you were adding to the creative community of RPGs in those days. These days, it's easier than ever to make a zine. All you need is to write out your ideas on Microsoft Word, find a piece of art from the Wikimedia Commons or some own crappy doodles of your own, hit convert to PDF, and you're off to the races. Get your social media account fired up, put it online, or put it on your blog, or put it on a community content platform. And, well, if it's the first thing you've ever made, it might not be a good zine, but it is a zine. That counts for a lot. And when I say zine in this modern context, some people are still making, you know, zines in the way they did in, uh, in the old days. But it could just as easily be a one-page RPG that fills in an image slot on Twitter, or it could be a, a three or four-page thing that you put up on a platform like the DMs Guild. A zine in this context is just the littlest unit of good game design you can manage to put together on your own. Semantics aside, from there, the real hard part is figuring out how to get people to look at it. You could go by the way they did it in the old days, go to a convention with a bunch of printed out copies handed to people, or, a, I don't know, hand out a card with a QR code they can scan to look at it, though I do think having a physical copy is a great way to get people to look at it. Lines are long, people go to the bathroom, all that, all that jazz. But there is still a pandemic going on. You might not feel safe going to conventions, or you might not have the money to afford a plane ticket to get to the convention, let alone the con ticket itself. But there is the internet. The only problem is the 
jungle is so dense over there. There are so many people trying to get through, so many ideas going out all the time, that it can be hard to get actual eyes on the thing that you've made. That's the dark side of RPGs getting so popular, I suppose. There was no internet when yeah. I started, and people have so many more resources at their mm -hmm. disposal. When I was a little kid in Canada trying to figure out how am I gonna get, how am I gonna start up my career in publishing, I had the magazines, and yeah. that was it. Now, people can reach out to each other and share their projects with one another instantaneously in so many different forms. I don't know necessarily if that's all good or all bad. I think there, there's a downside to it. Now, there's so much material mm -hmm. and so much coming so quickly that you don't get that attention mm -hmm. that I got as a young writer. Editors are too busy. But while a company like Wizards of the Coast may not give a new designer the time of day, there are a lot of mid-sized companies still out there. We can call them double-A gaming publishers, you know, like opposed to triple-A, right? There's Cobalt Press, which we talked about, Ghostfire Gaming, stuff like that. People who want third-party 5e content or other fantasy gaming content. And there's other companies beyond it, too. MCDM and Monty Cook Games managed to build a reputation for quality and uh, success based almost purely on the charisma of their well-known creators. And then, of course, there's Paizo, publisher of Pathfinder. They may be second banana to the 800-pound gorilla that is Wizards in D&D, but they've still got strong sales, and they've got a sassy, Sega-do-what-Nintendon't attitude. Okay, so back up. Why are we talking about zines again? Don't you want to write for D&D or for another RPG you love, like Call of Cthulhu or RuneQuest or something like that? Unless you want to self-publish your own indie RPG on itch.io or drive-thru RPG, a topic for another day, I think, uh, even indies need to buddy up sometimes in order to get their dream published. Zines and other forms of self-publishing are great for building up a portfolio and making material that you can use to show publishers that the games you make rock. So if you want to get published, you've got to show them that you've got these three things. Skill. This is the ability to design high quality games. It gives your publisher a fantastic product at the end of the day. There are lots of different disciplines of design skill, narrative design, content design, mechanical design. We'll talk about all of these disciplines another day on this channel. Audience. This is a following that enjoys your work and will follow you from project to project. It gives your publisher free marketing. And professionalism. This is when you turn your work in on time to the specifications given to you and treat your creative collaborators with respect. It gives your publisher an easy and predictable working experience. You don't need all of these things. You can give work with just two. But if you want to work for game studios full time, you want to be getting work consistently. You want to be getting too much work. You want to never have enough time to do all the work that people are trying to offer you. And the only way to get that is to be a triple threat. It's a bit controversial to say this, but do compare yourself to others in moderation. Look at what they're making. Can you do that yet? Are you doing something better? What can you do to make something as good as that? break down other people's work. A core tenet of this channel is taking other games that other people have made, right? And looking at what makes them so fantastic. Break them down into the tiniest, most atomic chunks you possibly can. And then look at why it's great. And then do it yourself. Copy it relentlessly. Self-assess again. Keep doing it. And you can ask for outside assessment too. Show your work to a friend or a colleague. Ask them what works. Ask them what doesn't. And if you're really brave, just throw it online and uh, drink from the fire hose of unfiltered opinions of the internet. And my secret tip is don't undervalue professionalism. I was kind, courteous, and timely in all of my communications early on, and I, I try to keep so today too. And even though my portfolio is weak at the beginning, I think that professional quality led people to want to work with me. They could tell that even if they needed to give me a little bit of coaching, I was gonna make their life easier in the long run. It's open doors for me, and it's open doors for other designers that I've met, like the designers who I met at 2022 Big Bad Con's POC meet and greet. There were plenty of designers there 
who were still building their audience, didn't have much of a portfolio to speak of, but still caught my attention because they were eager. And I got the sense that they would take feedback and criticism well. Essentially, that they were young, budding professionals. And I'd hire someone like that over a standoffish, industry veteran auteur any day. All right, so you need these three abilities and you don't have them. How do we change that? Well, the way to start is by making games, right? I told you to look at the games you like, go back, dissect them. Start by making the smallest game you can imagine. That could be a one-page RPG like Honey Heist, if you're into indies. Or it could be a five-room dungeon, if you're into fantasy adventure games. Or maybe even just a single subclass or magic item or monster, if you're really into the mechanical design of highly mechanized games like D&D and Pathfinder. And if you have good taste, you'll probably think what you've made is a little bit crap, especially compared to the stuff that the professionals are putting out. But that's okay. Do another short project next week or next month, and then another one the month after that, and another one and another one and another one. Keep creating, keep making games, keep making bad games, keep making bad games over and over and over again until you start to see games that have a little bit of good in them, and then a little bit more good and a little bit more and a little bit more until you've got a game that is actually quite fun to play, whose mistakes have been ironed out through the process of rapid iteration. Because that's the cheat code to leveling up this skill really fast, right? Every time you iterate, you gain some experience. And if you shorten the time between iterations, you will power level the hell out of that thing. Uh, that's a bad... <laughs> I should cut that one. So now that you've made something, it's time to get it out there. How do you do that? Well, Twitter is burning, and the DMs Guild is flooded with so many submissions that no one knows what to look for anymore, so I think the way to do it these days, though I'm not an expert on this, is to find a nice private RPG Discord. Those smaller communities have, uh, have a couple of pros and cons to them. One, um, unlike big communities like Twitter, you know, you're probably not going to have thousands upon thousands of eyes looking at your thing, um, but the, the pro is that if you're on an RPG-specific Discord, well, probably the eyes that are on it are going to be more engaged than the sort of random chaff that Twitter throws your stuff towards. No matter how you do it, one way or another, people are going to start noticing that you make good stuff as you post it over and over again. It uh, won't happen fast. It'll happen uh, excruciatingly slow, probably. There's a lot of good game stuff out there made by people who are a lot better at it than, than you are, no offense, uh, right now, because they've had years and years and years and they've got huge budgets or you know even small budgets, but they know how to work a small budget. So you are starting from square one. Make something that's worthy of square one, like we were talking about earlier. People will find your stuff. You just have to have patience. If you treat your commenters with respect while they're looking at all of this, all of this stuff that you've made, whether it's cool yet or not, um, people will start to get the sense that you're a decent person. People will start to get the sense that it's it's easy and even fun sometimes to give you feedback, to look at the stuff you've made and be like, I like this, I don't like this, this, is, this could be better. They'll come back to you over and over and over again. And eventually you'll start making friends. You might even start making peers, people who are also making RPGs who are kind of roughly at your skill level. And that's how you build an audience. These peers who you'll meet this way, other designers or artists or graphic designers, these are other travelers through the jungle. These are not your competition. These are people who you want in your party, and they want you to be in their party right back. These are creative collaborators, people who you can pool your strength and resources with once you've realized, hey, I think I could do something with this guy. They might have skills that you don't. You might have skills that they don't. Maybe they're a whiz at narrative design, while well, you've got strong mechanical design chops. Maybe they can illustrate, while well, you can use Adobe InDesign to put stuff into graphic layout. Or maybe they're an editor, and they need something to edit. And once you've made these friends, consider doing a collab with them. This is a good place to train your professionalism. 
it's a it's easier to get better at working and talking with creatives in an arena like this where the stakes are low you're just chatting with a couple of friends online uh, rather than you know getting the jitters when it's time for the biggest professional job interview of your creative career yeah I uh, no personal experience on that one mm. let's hold up for a moment though skill grinding metaphors aside this is real life and the most important thing you get out of improving any of these three skills, at least in the early term. It's not professional success, it's not money, it's not any of those things. It's friends. Writing is a really lonely job. When you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. But that's bullshit. I love what I do, and let me tell you something. I've worked some days. But now, back to the jungle. So you've been doing it for a while. You've released a few one-page adventures, a couple of dungeons, maybe some mechanical design, maybe a whole one-page RPG out there into the howling void of the internet. You've met some companions, you've been journeying for some time. You think you're ready. You think you can march right up to the gates of one of those shining cities in the jungle, one of those great companies that can publish your work and get it in front of thousands of eyes. How? Well, you need to get their attention somehow. Those walls are high, shouting there at the gate, hello, hello. They'll never hear you. Sometimes I open their gates, it's an open call. A mid-sized company wants as many submissions as they possibly can. That happened a lot at the beginning of 5th edition. A lot of third-party D&D-style publishers, like Kobold Press and so on, uh, they wanted new talent. They needed new talent. And so they would host design contests or just open submissions. Anyone could throw their hat in the ring. Usually only a handful of people would uh, get selected, but someone would. And to the tune of... It's not what you know, it's who you know. Sometimes a friend will be an in that you have to a major gaming publication or, or publishing house. Maybe your friend knows someone at Paizo. Maybe you collaborated with someone who made an article for Arcadia back in the day, and that might be an in you have at MCDM. Either way, you now have the opportunity to submit a pitch. That's usually one paragraph that shows off the cool idea you have that you think they will want to publish. In fact, you give the best damn pitch of your life. And they say no, because they always do, or worse of all, they don't say anything and you're just left waiting for days and then weeks and then months and you give up. So what gives? Well, there's one more ability that you need to have. And it's a pretty sobering one at that mind reading. So by the time I was in college and starting to pitch ideas, they were getting accepted more often than not because I had figured out the game. And there is a game to, to everything. Once you understand the rules behind the real game going on, I figured this system out. I know what the editors want, so I'm going to give them what they want. And I'm paying attention to what the comp what's coming out. I'm reading every issue of the magazine that's coming out, and I'm seeing what's been published. Mm. So I'm not giving them stuff they've done before. On the one hand, I am writing because I enjoy it, but I'm also writing for other people. And that's my life. I'm not right. This isn't a vanity project. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm creating something to sell to others, and that means that it's got to have the things that they want, and that's that drives a lot of our storytelling in oh. Wizards of the Coast. We don't see ourselves as a vanity press. We're not doing these books for us. We're doing these books for the fans. We're trying to anticipate what they want based on what we're hearing from them. So if a story, if we don't think a story is gonna resonate with them, we won't do it. Sooner rather than later, there's gonna be a lot of RPG companies, particularly in the third party D&D space, but I think beyond it too, who are gonna be looking to expand their ranks. They're gonna be looking for new, talent, fresh meat. And here's why. The explanation lies in the path that I took through the jungle nearly 10 years ago. And it looks something like this. In a time of great change around the launch of 5th edition D&D in 2014, 
I submitted relentlessly to design contests and open calls, things like Kobold Press's Monarch of the Monsters and Lethal Lairs contests. You can look those up on Google even now. And uh, Paizo Publishing's RPG Superstar competition. Uh, and I was rejected time and time and time again. But times of change are when companies look for new talent. And eventually, all that relentlessness and uh, sort of continual refinement of my work paid off. I won one of those contests. I won Lethal Lairs for Kobold Press. And that thing that I made, that I submitted for them, uh, got published in an actual physical book, Eldritch Lairs. It, unbelievable. Uh, and because I'd made that relationship, they wanted me to make a few more dungeons for Eldritch Lairs. They saw that I could do good work, and I was very kind and courteous, and I was talking with them. And in the meantime, I wrote my own adventures. I was away from home, I was in college, I didn't have a really stable D&D group, and so I put all of my ideas into writing rather than DMing, and I wanted to put it up on the internet. I talked, I, I watched a lot of Matt Colville's videos, and I saw that he you know, really loved Against the Cult of the Reptile God, and I saw that its three-act structure was really good. We'll talk about three-act structure in another video, too, I think. Um, and I was like, I can do that. I can do something better than Cult of the Reptile God, I said with all the ego of a college sophomore. Uh, and I, I made something, and I don't think it was as uh, good or better than Cult of the Reptile God, but it was, it was very... Uh, it, it was very my first adventure, um, and, and I still think I did a good job. You can, it's, it's on the DMs Guild. It's called the Temple of Shattered Minds, if you want to look at you know, what, what, my, what my work looked like in 2016 or whatever. It's, uh, I, I think there's good things about it. Yeah, I think, I, I think there's good things about it. Anyway, I took all of those things that I'd made, uh, Dungeons for Kobold Press, my own full adventure for the DMs Guild, and I'd put, I put that in my portfolio. I put that on resumes, and uh, in in that time, as sort of third party five E stuff was getting spun up, right in a sort of pre five E OGL days when it was all kind of shaky whether or not this was legal. Uh, a British company that ran an RPG news site, N World, that I uh, followed religiously in the D&D Next playtest, put out a zine called Insider, E N numeral five I D E R. Very funny, haha. <laughs> uh, and it was a five E zine. They wanted to be really first on the field, and uh, that they needed an editor for it. I threw my hat in the ring. Uh, I gave them my resume, I gave them a portfolio, and I can only assume no one else applied because I got the job. And I, I stayed with that, you know, part-time little zine editing job for, I think, four or five years, and I met a lot of great people, like, like James Intercasso, who is now a uh, head at MCDM, who collaborated with me and Chris Perkins on Waterdeep Dragon Heist. I, his first RPG job was through Insider. He was my first friend in this field. Uh, and, and it it carried on and on and on. And I, I continued doing this process where the stuff I was making, you know, had, it toiled in obscurity a little bit, but I was making friends. I was having a good time. You know, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a position where I didn't need to be making big boy money all the time. I was still a student, very privileged enough to have my parents helping me with the, the cost of college. Not everyone has that. Um, it's why, that sort of thing is why I suggest you don't quit your day job, right? Have a means of supporting yourself while you do this artistic venture until you really feel very strongly that you can pull it off full time. And I continued like this until I got lucky, right? There's the old adage that opportunity is luck meets preparedness. I was prepared. I was doing a lot of work. My work was getting better all the time. No one knew about it, except for the, you know, the 500 person Twitter following I had and my, my friends on RPG Twitter of the time. Um, but then as I was ignoring a lecture, a theater history two lecture uh, in class, I, I saw the Geek and Sundry, then, you know, top of the world Geek and Sundry, Will Wheaton's tabletop at the forefront. I just learned of them. I just watched the fiasco episode of that. They put out a call for an editorial intern and I thought, hey, this looks fun. Um, so I submitted that resume, which had the D&D &D work I had done on it. 
and uh, by some miracle they hired me. And that miracle was unbeknownst to me that a few months ago they had uh, started this little thing called Critical Role, right? And they needed people. They needed people on their staff who knew what the hell D&D was and how to write about it in a confident and interesting manner. And from there, I mean, it it, it, it all exploded, right? I, I don't know if I deserved it. I don't think anyone deserves the luck that comes to them in this industry. You, you either... You either find it or you don't, and you either capitalize on it or you don't. And uh, and I did. I wound up writing the Tal'Dorei campaign setting with Matthew Mercer, and that book led to Waterdeep Dragon Heist with Wizards, and that book led to working as the uh, content marketer for D&D Beyond for several years, where I wrote a bunch of articles three times a week, relentlessly. And that led to working with Ghostfire Gaming, and you know, on and on and on and on into doing a whole lot of cool stuff that uh, has allowed me to become a creative professional over all this time. So, yeah, by the time I'd left D&D Beyond, I'd earned a reputation, a good reputation, someone who did good work, who had an audience they could bring to a project, and who would turn in their work on time, communicate in a friendly way, and overall make the project a, a fun one to be on. So while that's my path so far, that path is gone. Just like Chris Perkins, that path has been devoured by the jungle. You cannot follow it, right? You cannot get in on the ground floor of Critical Role anymore because you happen to be in California at the time. Um, you cannot get in on the ground floor of 5th edition D&D without knowing that it would pop off like it did. But you can do something like that because despite all the changes that have happened between then and now there's an even bigger change on the horizon a new core trio of D&D books are about to be released in 2024 which means that third party publishers are going to be on the hunt for people who know exactly how that game is worded who can speak the language of that game and who have got the can do attitude that professionals need to have so if you love Dungeons and Dragons, and you want to be a part of it in the way that Chris did, in the way that I did, the time to start honing your skills is now. And if you want to design for other games like Call of Cthulhu, Vampire the Masquerade, Rune Quest, it's a pretty good time to get on that now, too, because there's going to be a lot of buzz around D&D. And I'll tell you what that means. It means that a lot of people are going to get sick of D&D and move on to another game that speaks to them more specifically. And just take a look at Chaosium's community content programs. They're equivalent of the Dungeon Masters Guild, or, you know, the same for Vampire or something like that. I guarantee you that those venues are going to be a lot less crowded than the DM's Guild. You know what that means? Fewer eyes, but more likely those eyes are going to be looking at your thing. So, good luck, my friends. Whatever path you choose to take through the jungle, I know it will be one you believe in. And even though I can't take you step by step, I hope that these videos, this creative community, will be a safe place for you to return to when times get hard, when you lose focus, when you need new insight. Some place you can return to time and time again on your journey. Hey folks, this is a pretty story timey video with some industry history and a lot of my own teen idolization turned professional uh, respect for Chris Perkins thrown in. Uh, what did you think of this style? I mean, when I'm talking about game design, I usually like to approach it from a pretty professional, analytical standpoint, show you examples of games I like that do certain things well. But uh, for some topics like this one, I think it's a lot easier to focus in on my own experiences. Uh, this is the third video of a little starter pack uh, made to showcase the, the types of videos being made for this channel. Right, there's You Are a Game Designer, which kind of breaks down the uh, uh, way of thinking about games that this channel is going to do. There's One Die Shouldn't Rule Them All, which is uh, a design analysis. And there's this one, which is story time uh, and uh, more sort of like business career inside baseball. So uh, what do you like best? Which style is the best? Let me know in the comments and uh, forgive me. I'm gonna do the YouTuber thing, right? Like, subscribe, bell icon, <laughs> comment. Make this place your home. 
right? I mean, uh, have a drink, have some fun, chat with some people. Uh, help us build a creative community here uh, of people who think deeply about games and want to share that knowledge and those things that they have created with the world. Uh, I'm chatting with friends of mine. Uh, about creating a Discord server for y'all, just so that, uh, you know, the YouTube comments aren't where we need to live. Uh, I want to get that off the ground in a successful, safe, healthy way, and uh, I don't I don't know enough about Discord to do that yet, but I believe it will happen. So, until we get all that figured out, thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.